to Greece and Cyprus through visits and collaborations with scholars and cultural producers. Already this year, we have hosted visits from the filmmaker Mary Zonazi and the historian Kostis Cordendis. In the fall, Yefira continues its programming at UCLA, Simon Fraser University, and other West Coast institutions with visits from Dr. Julia Tulke, who in October will present Aesthetics of Crisis, Political Street Art and Graffiti in Athens, 2013 to 2023, and the Greek author and journalist Helena Mateopoulos, who will lecture in November on Maria Callas, The State of Flame. From October 19th to 21st, Yekbera will be hosting a conference envisioning the Greek landscape from zero to climate change in Athens. This conference is being organized by Dr. James Horncastle, Humanities Edward and Emily McWinney, Professor in International Relations in the Department of Global Humanities at Simon Fraser University, and Dr. Dr. Katerina Lagos, Professor of History and Director of the Hellenic Studies Program at Cal State Sacramento. And from November 18th to 19th, 2023, the program will further host an international conference at UCLA, which I will be organizing together with art history PhD student Sofia Pitulli on the generation of the 1930s. Finally, we're happy to announce that through the Yefeda program, we will be bringing renowned Greek film director Tassos Vometis for an artistic residency at UCLA and Simon Fraser University in fall 2023, and the musicologist Alexander Lingas, artistic director of Capella Romana, for an artistic residency in fall 2024. If, like me, you stayed up late to watch the coronation of Charles III, you will know that it was yeah. Dr. Lingas who conducted the superb performance of the Byzantine Ensemble during the ceremony. <laughs> we have much to look forward to. So on behalf of both of the centers, I would like to thank the Stavros Miracles Foundation for its ongoing support and vision, and also the staff of both centers for their extremely hard work to organize the activities and many others. Today's event brings to UCLA a renowned historian, Ascalus Kitomilidis, who was first slated to come to the West Coast to lecture in a pan-California conference we co-organized together with Cal State Sacramento, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University on the Greek Revolution. This event was unfortunately canceled due to COVID. At that time, we had every intention of celebrating the publication of Professor Kitromilidis' landmark work, The Greek Revolution, a critical dictionary, which I had a moment ago on the podium here. It's somewhere in the room. Uh, and I'll leave a copy of you for you to look at following the lecture. But 2021 and the celebration of the Greek Revolution passed. And we entered another year and the contemplation of yet another challenging phase of Greece's history, the so-called Asia Minor catastrophe, the study of the Hellenic communities of Asia Minor, their slaughter, and their dispersal. This moment of contemplation provided us with an opportunity to again invite Professor Kitimilidis to fly west, this time to call on his deep expertise on a topic that has enormous historical and emotional resonance. I will leave the official introduction to Dimitris Kralis, but simply want to say how very glad I am that we were able to finally host on the West Coast. Thank you. With that, I would like to invite the Consul General of Greece and Los Angeles, Ioannis Tamatakos, to take the podium, and he will be followed by the Honorary Consul General of Cyprus, Andreas Kiprianidis. Thank you very much. And let me start by saying what a great honor uh, it is to have the esteemed Professor Pascalis Kitromilidis with us uh, this afternoon for what I'm, uh, I am sure will be a fascinating exposition of uh, the history of uh, Hellenism in Asia Minor. Let me also uh, thank the UCLA Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Center for this uh, study of uh, Hellenic culture and its director Sharon Gerstein for organizing along with uh, Professor Kravis from uh, Simon Fraser University today's lecture with such a special and distinct guest. As Professor Gerstein said uh, last year, 2022 marked the centennial anniversary of the Asia Minor catastrophe, the greatest collective trauma uh, of our recent past, of Greece's recent past. This year marks the centennial anniversary, anniversary of the Treaty of Lausanne, 
that led to the official termination of the 25th century long Hellenic presence in Asia Minor, Pontus and Cappadocia. Through an exchange of populations, one and a half million souls took off for the Great Exodus. The Treaty of Lausanne serves also as the foundation of uh, the relationship between Greece and Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, the Asia Minor catastrophe is arguably the second major turning point of modern uh, Greece after the, uh, the 1821 revolution and the rebirth of uh, modern Greece, the Ethniki Mas Palygenesia. It represented a major ethnological disaster that uh, resulted in the contraction of the Greek presence for the first time in almost 3,000 years. Uh, only the western and northern shores of the Aegean are populated by Greeks. Greeks and the Greek language have always been, lived on both shores of the Aegean and in the islands of the Aegean Sea that connect the two shores. But there was a silver lining uh, to the Asia Minor catastrophe. It turned out to have a positive eventual outcome for Greece. The vast majority of the refugees decided to grow roots again on their new homes in the motherland. This was the starting point for the national reconstruction effort that was to follow, that led to the successful integration of the refugees in the national body, arguably the greatest peacetime achievement of the Greek state. Moreover, it led also to a major shift regarding the Greek foreign policy doctrine. From the Megali idea, that is, the geographical conquest to liberate the unredeemed lands, the Alicrotes Patrides, that was defined in Greek foreign policy in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, and its ambivalence about Greece's geopolitical position between East and West, to a new Megali idea that is creating a modern, strong, self-reliant Greece, firmly anchored to the political and security institutions of the West, such as the European Union and NATO. This has not been a path without obstacles and challenges, from the national division, the Greek civil war, to the military uh, junta, even to the rise of populism during the years of uh, the, Greek finan the Greek financial crisis. But as Konstantinos Karamalis, one of the greatest Greek statesmen that lived in the 20th century put it, Greece belongs to the West, an ecumenist this. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank Professor Gestell for this opportunity to say a few words. Tonight, you are going to hear a lot about the last year's career of our distinguished speaker. I am going to say a few words about some facts that only someone from Paphos, like me, can talk about. <laughs> I like to remind you that Paphos is the westernmost part of Cyprus, the place where Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love, was born, where St. Paul visited first when he went to Cyprus in 44 AD to talk about Christianity. My fellow Paphians, or Paphides, they beat him up in the beginning because they thought he was a wise guy, but later they behaved. Professor Kitromilidis came from the most prominent, and I think I know what I'm talking about, most prominent family of Paphos at the time. His mother, Martha, on her mother's side, came from a family that could, could boast many successful businessmen, lawyers, and a long-time mayor of the city, Nicolas Nicolaidis, whom I remember very well, a man 
dedicate, who dedicated his life, I think he's you are not too, right? He dedicated his life to the secondary education of Pathos. Magda's mother, Paschalitz Paschalitz, who was born in Asia Minor, he came to Paphos as a young educator, and in 1924, he established the first and only full high school in Paphos, my alma mater, the Erico Gymnasio Paphos. Magda went on to become a distinguished philologist. She married another brilliant philologist from Nicosia, Mikis Mitromilidis, and they both became famous high school professors. For a few years, they taught at the Paphos High School, and they were greatly respected, admired, and loved by their students. They left for Nicosia a year before I went to high school, but their great fame lingered on for years to come. In Nicosia, they continued teaching. Magda became the gymnasiarchis, the principal of the largest high school for girls in Cyprus while her husband, Mitis Kitonilidis, became the vice principal of the Pancyprian Gymnasium, Pancyprio Gymnasium, the most important high school in Cyprus, the high school from where most of the presidents of Cyprus graduated from. As you can see, our distinguished teacher comes from a renowned family of educators and community leaders. He is a distinguished educator himself and a prolific writer. And he has brought great honor, not only to himself, but to his family, his forefathers, but also to Cyprus and Hellenism in general. Today, it is my high honor indeed to welcome him and his son Michalis, the young Michalis Petrovich, to our city to salute him for his extraordinary accomplishments and to wish him and his family everything good. There is a, a lot more I can say. But I am going to adhere to an old secret <coughs> saying, a favorite of mine. Tarira Loya Zachary, she's a Catholic man. A few words are like sugar, and no words at all are like her. Besides, my friend, Sharon Gestel is beginning to look at your watch. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, I have script, and I'm mostly stick to it, but uh, I want to follow up on that, uh, on, on your introduction, uh, because uh, it just reminds us uh, uh, how significant uh, family histories, uh, micro histories, personal stories are for engaging uh, with the past. Uh, we often stick to big narratives and forget that we can get uh, a lot of granularity uh, and a lot of illumination of, uh, of the human experience by actually focusing on, on the small details. And I think that what you did with, uh, uh, with this introduction was, uh, was totally valuable. And now let me go back to my script. Next, Sharon looks at her watch again. Uh, <laughs> So, it is, my, it is truly my great pleasure to be here with you uh, today uh, to engage with uh, the ideas and work of uh, Professor Pascalis Kitromilidis. 
uh, a Harvard uh, uh, trained scholar with a long career as professor at the Department of Politics of the National Catholic University of Athens and director of the National Hellenic Research Foundation, full member of the Academy of Athens and commander of the Order of Honor of the Hellenic Republic. Now, Sharon has already pointed out uh, the name that we chose uh, for uh, the collaboration between uh, the UCLA uh, SNF uh, Hellenic Center and, uh, and, and our center up uh, in Vancouver, Jethira Bridge. Uh, because of the connections uh, that it seeks to create between uh, points uh, on a map and between uh, people, uh, scholars, students, uh, artists on those, uh, on those points. It is on this bridge that uh, Professor Kitomir is traveling to be here with us. In a way, however, he's here also because we're all uh, keen to have among us a person whose own career and intellectual journey has formed bridges. Bridges that link points in the map of the world from Harvard to Athens, Oxford, Cambridge, Paris, Rome, Florence, and so on, to mention but a few locations where uh, he has studied, worked, and held uh, uh, research appointments, but also bridges that link distinct thematic and uh, disciplinary worlds, all brought together in his research output and, uh, and teaching. Now, uh, personally, as a historian with uh, interest in Byzantine governance, I have what uh, might uh, be seen as an all too keen fascination with lists. Whether those are lists of uh, uh, dignities, provincial armies, plots of monastic lands, and uh, uh, so on. I, in general, found them, uh, find them instructive. And today I want to use a heavily abridged list of uh, titles or works by Professor Kitom Levis as a compass to guide you, if you will, uh, through his intellectual uh, universe. Bear with me just for a moment. I will be, uh, I assure you, the list is more interesting than my Byzantine lists. So here, here's a few titles of works by our guests, and those are selected uh, uh, both randomly and with some uh, logic behind them. The Enlightenment and Revolution, The Making of Modern Greece, John Locke, A Second Treatise on Civil Government, a translation. Uh, translation work is critical for all of us. Ecclesiastical autocephaly and national independence. The first many zealous in Greek political thought. At the origins of European political thought, political ideas in Eschidian tragedy. Orthodoxy and the Enlightenment. The Byzantine legacy in early modern political thought. The Athonite intellectual tradition and the challenges of modernity. Now, the work cited here give you a sense of Professor Kitom Lewis's range. They take you from the world of Aeschylus to the Greek Enlightenment, from monasteries of Mount Athos as laboratories of political thought to the lives of notable political figures such as Venizelos, and finally back to the European Enlightenment, which uh, with his work, uh, Professor Kitom Lewis has tightly linked uh, the Greek intellectual experience. All these works, however, uh, all, all these works, however, uh, a small, heavily anthologized part from a large meadow of, work of uh, uh, scholarly erudition need to be taken as part of a larger persona, which, in my mind, only emerges when Professor Kikomir is also seen in his capacity as a teacher. And here I can get personal, as I studied with him at the Department of Politics of the University of Athens, taking his two introductions to European political theory, ancient to medieval and early modern to modern, over two semesters in 93-94, so I can date myself to. The courses were in seminar format, around 20 or 25 of us sitting in a long seminar room, and taken on a journey from Sophocles to Plato, Aristotle to Augustine. I admit, Pascale, I only read 600 pages of the City of Gods, 1,000. <laughs> but I went, until 600 at least, to Marcellus of Padua, and then the next semester, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Marx, Burke, Paine, and so on. The experience was unlike any other at the university. It asked all of us to read extensively, immerse ourselves in difficult texts, think about the complex ways in which all those pieces of writing help people in different places understand themselves as political beings. I feel that I could never have passed that course with my mind as it is today, fragmented by emails and the glittering allure of uh, the internet that gives us whiplash every time we click on another, on another uh, page. I'm grateful for the opportunity Professor Kitomir gave me back then to just lose myself in texts 
and then be forced to think about them so that they could build a sense of intellectual legacies on which our world has been built. As a historian, very much still interested in politics, government, and the thinking behind these processes, I've been profoundly personally affected by my experience in Professor Kitomidis' class at the Department of Politics of the University of Athens. Now, with this little personal aside on the importance of teaching, let's remember we are in a university, uh, sometimes we forget the importance of teaching in the relentless focus on research outputs in, uh, in our modern uh, institutions. I want to call Professor Kitomidis to the podium for his talk, which is entitled Historical Tra Trajectories of Hellenism in Asia Minor, a topic very much related to his long tenure as director of the Center for Asia Minor Studies in Athens. Thank you. Well, I have been sitting there wondering whom this, all these people were talking about, and I could hardly recognize him. But anyway, it's, it's nice. It's nice to hear nice things about oneself, although he may not believe them himself. But thank you, thank you very much. And I thank the, of course, Sharon and uh, Dimitris for organizing this campaign to the West Coast, uh, where I had come a few times in the past. And of course, I, ha I thank my two general counsels, my two homelands, Greece and Cyprus, for all they have said. And of course, the general counsel of Cyprus in particular for remembering my family in, in Paphos. Thank you very much. And all of you, the community of Southern California for being here uh, this afternoon. Uh, On the occasion of this visit to UCLA, which is my second visit, I think, after 35 years, I cannot but remember my host the first time I came to UCLA, uh, a great uh, scholar, Professor Spiros Vrionis, whose work on Asia Minor has been a major, a formative influence indeed in all that I have done uh, in this uh, subject since my graduate school days at Harvard when, as a matter of fact, I wrote one of my graduate research papers taking his work on the Islamization of Asia Minor as my point of departure. So UCLA possesses all these multiple significances for me and I'm grateful uh, to be here. So in what I have uh, to say this afternoon, I would like to take you back into the history of the eastern shores of the Aegean, the world of Asia Minor. And perhaps we should begin with a few remarks about Asia Minor as an idea. In the first place, Asia Minor, this Peninsula is a concept of geography, a geographical term. The Lesser Asia, a Lasson Asia of the ancients, the Western Peninsula and extremity in which the enormous Asian continent terminates. Asia Minor as a geographical entity constitutes in many senses a miniature of this vast hinterland. And if I may show you a map to which I will repeatedly refer, you can see what I mean saying that it is a miniature of the vast Asian continent with the mountain ranges, the deserts, the big rivers which shape the geographical profile of this part of the Mediterranean world. As a geographical idea, Asia Minor runs through the historical thought of a great historian of the Mediterranean world, Fernand Brodel, 
Although in his seminal work on the Mediterranean, he focuses on the long 16th century, Brodel underlines the weight of permanent geographical factors in shaping historical destinies and the character of societies. His references to Asia Minor throughout this work are multiple, occasionally surprisingly penetrating, although his focus is on the Spanish Empire primarily, but he says so many original and penetrating things about other parts, and especially Asia Minor, that makes his work a constant source of inspiration for people interested in the flow of history beyond the externalities which we tend to remember without understanding what is going underneath in the flow of historical change. Of particular interest is Brodel's discussion of the significance of peninsulas in the Mediterranean world, including, of course, Asia Minor, which he describes as regions which are richest in persons and potential. They are key actors, he says, who have always played leading roles, in turn gathering strength and then expanding it. Let's just have a look at the peninsulas. You see the peninsula and another peninsula and another peninsula and other peninsulas in the West. And if you reflect about the history of these places, you appreciate what Brodel means when he says these places gather strength and they expand it. The dynamism of Mediterranean peninsulas is illustrated, according to Brodel, by expressions of collective life in which geographical and historical factors are intertwined. And thus we can appreciate in a perhaps determinist way the unchanging factors which determine historical destinies. So this world, which was so much appreciated by a great historian like Brodel, who was trying to look at the deeper forces of history, has been a major factor in the trajectory of the history of Hellenism. So let's go back to this. And the fascination exercised by this space in its distant Asiatic hinterland exerted a powerful attraction on the Greeks who lived on the western shores of the Aegean. This was a driving force of Greek colonization with, with its successive waves from around the year 1000 BC onward. From this eastward movement, the flourishing Greek cities of Ionia, and more broadly, the western part of the peninsula, emerged. And then, from this part, a second wave of colonization to the northern parts of the peninsula created the Greek world around the Black Sea. And a third wave from here created a broader Greek world on the north and western shores of the Black Sea. And of course, this world, you see the Crimea, and you see the Sea of Azov, it's, it's the Meotis Lake of the ancients about which Aeschylus speaks 
in the Prometheus. This is the theater of a tragedy we are just witnessing unfolding before our eyes today with the Russian invasion and the destruction that has brought precisely in those regions of ancient Greek colonization. So it was from the cities of Ionia and Aeolis that we can witness the first efflorescence of ancient Greek culture. The primordial creative expression of Greek discourse and of the Greek spirit. The epics of Homer, lyric poetry, the beginnings of philosophical and scientific thought, what has been termed the transition from myth to reason, from Thales of Miletus to Heraclitus of Ephesus. All of these early expressions of the Greek spirit emanated from this part, from the eastern shores of the Aegean. And it goes from Ionia that philosophy was transplanted to Athens with Anaxagoras of Clazomene. And from Ionia, that serious religious reflection in the ancient world emanated with Xenophanes of Colophon, who was the first of the ancient philosophers who spoke about monotheism. So all of these things were initiated on the eastern part of the Aegean. Of course, Anaxagoras, the great critical mind who transplanted philosophy to Athens, was eventually expelled by the Athenians, who were of this character. If somebody disturbed them too much, if he was a citizen, they would execute him, as they did with Socrates. But Anaxagoras, they sent back. So all of this connected with Asia Minor. The intellectual burgeoning of Ionia and Aeolis was cut short by the Persian conquest of Lesser Asia, known from, uh, for, uh, known from the narrative of Herodotus. However, the conquest and the uprising to which it ended furnished the Greek world with another idea crucial and important for its self-awareness, the idea of freedom. 599 BC, of the Ionians, but also the Cypriots, who also rose that year against the Persian occupation of their lands. And all of this is related in the fifth book of the histories of Herodotus. Of course, the uprising was crushed, both in Ionia and Cyprus. And it was dramatized by the earliest Athenian dramatic poet, Phrynichos, who staged a tragedy entitled The Fall of Miletus, Miletu Alosis, and it so much disturbed the Athenians that they exiled him for reminding them of their failure to support the Asia Minor Greeks in their struggle for freedom. The subjection to the Persian yoke lasted for several decades. In fact, for another more than, for another century and a half, and slightly more, until it was finally thrown off by Alexander the Great in 334 BC. That Alexander's campaign was experienced as liberation by the Greeks of Asia Minor is recorded epigrammatically in the famous inscription of the third century by, from the city of Prini, which is a thankful inscription to a benefactor of the city of Prini, but it contains the following sentence, nothing is greater for the Greeks than liberty who then misonest in anthropis elisi tis eleftherias. So this too is part of the heritage of Asia Minor Hellenism. The Greek world of Asia Minor provided the bedrock and central core of the Eastern Roman Empire 
from the time when the capital was transferred to New Rome in 330, and for nearly all the subsequent millennium, the millennium of the Middle Ages. This epoch could in many senses be considered to be the long durée of the great glory of Hellenism in Asia Minor, a veritable saga of creation and endeavor of more general significance and importance for the civilization of the Middle Ages on a pan-European scale. Asia Minor, from Bithynia in the northwest to Pontos in Cappadocia, was what chiefly constituted Byzantium from the 5th until the 11th century and beyond. In this cradle of Byzantine civilization, the literature and art of the Christian world flourished as evidenced by the splendid monuments of Cappadocia and numerous medieval monuments of Pontos and imposing monuments elsewhere in the peninsula at Nicaea, at Pergamos, at Myra, the city of St. Nicholas that have survived the ravages of historical upheavals. And of course, many other monuments have disappeared. But these surviving monuments are the material evidence of the splendors of the medieval civilization of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor. It was in Asia Minor also in the fourth century that took place the synthesis of Hellenic and Christian spirit in the theological, but also the social thought of the great Cappadocian fathers with whom all subsequent patristic thinking in East and West engages. The defense of the Eastern Roman Empire against the Persian and Arab threats from the East was carried out primarily in Asia Minor. In order to defend itself, Byzantium introduced into Asia Minor the political and military organization of the themes. The defensive effort in Asia Minor secured the frontier of the empire on the Euphrates. This was a period that the great Byzantine scholar Gustave Schlumberger has called l'epopée byzantine. It was from that historical experience that emanated the earliest, perhaps, cycle of folk epic poetry in Europe, the acritic epics. And this tradition of folk poetry has been elaborated in many parts, both of Asia Minor and also in Cyprus, on the eastern frontier of the Byzantine world, and has been transmitted down to us by folk poetry. The burgeoning of Christian Hellenism in Asia Minor was typically reflected in the ecclesiastical geography and the network of monastic foundations which covered the peninsula. From Cappadocia, the center, where Cenopedic monasticism made its first appearance thanks to Basil the Great, to the holy mountains of the peninsula. Before the holy mountains of Athos, there were holy mountains at Latros in Caria and at Olympus in Bithynia, which were associated with the ascetic life of many of the church's saints. And the models of Cenopedic monasticism were transplanted from Asia Minor to the West in the seventh century by Saint Benedict, who was inspired by Basil the Great in drawing up the rule of the Benedict order. If you think of the significance of Cenopedic monasticism in Asia Minor and the West, the Benedictines and the monasteries of Asia Minor, in the transmission of the classical heritage, the coping and recoping of the classical tests which saved classical literature for us, you can appreciate the inestimable debt modernity has 
towards medieval monasticism, whose major field of development was Asia Minor. It should be added that the beginning of the decline of medieval Hellenism in Asia Minor constituted the most important consequence of the defeat of the Byzantine troops at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. But the Turkmen tribes which invaded Asia Minor from the east, the result of those incursions and the loss of the eastern and central regions of the peninsula by the Roman Empire initiated the gradual ethnological decline of Hellenism, which eventually resulted in the Turkification of Asia Minor. The process exactly started by Spiros Vrionis in his great book. A, great, a large portion of the population was Islamized and eventually became Turkophone, while in the western regions the exodus of successive waves of refugees towards the north in Thrace created demographic gaps which were filled by Muslim populations. The phenomenon of the Islamization of Asia Minor has been studied as just mentioned by Spiros Vrionis, whose contribution to our understanding, however, is even more significant because he also talks about what he describes as the Byzantine residues in Asia Minor, which means the survival, survival of Greek-speaking or Turkish-speaking Orthodox populations in the interior of the peninsula into the 20th century. The Byzantine residues in Asia Minor were connected chiefly with the presence in the peninsula of the two Byzantine states, which emerged after the fall of Constantinople to the Crusaders in 1204. The Empire of Nicaea and the Empire of Trebizond. Nicaea, here, and this region down to the Aegean form a ramp Byzantine state, which survived as a bulwark of Turkmen expansion into Asia Minor. And this explains the fact that in the western part of the continent, of the peninsula, the most densely populated region was Bithynia, with 181 settlements of Greek Orthodox population down to 1922-24. The other state was the Empire of Trebizond on, in the northern regions. And that other Ram Greek state, which was the last medieval Greek state to succumb to the Ottomans, Constantinople eventually fell in 1453, but Trebizond fell in 1461. And its presence, the presence of the empire of the Grat Komnini in the Pontic regions, and especially in the highlands, in the, Alpi, in the Pontic Alps, secured the survival of a dense community of Greek speakers speaking a highly idiomatic Greek idiom into the 20th century, which represents an extraordinary phenomenon of ethnological survival and cohesion over many centuries. And what is really amazing and was not known until the research of the refugee population which came to Greece from Pontus by the Center for Asia Minor Studies. This population was scattered in northeastern Asia Minor and its mountainous hinterland in almost 1,500 settlements of Orthodox, Pontic speaking, or in some cases, Turkish speaking villages which maintain their Christian Orthodox faith until the time of Exodus and beyond. 
that is the amazing phenomenon of Pontus, which is one of the great curiosities, but also one of the great illustrations of what Brodel was saying about the way the peninsula concentrated strength and then strength in human resources and then spend it. Forgotten behind the lines of confrontation bet between the Byzantines, the Seljuks, and the Turkmen. Deep in the interior of Asia Minor Peninsula, beyond the area of the, of the deserts, in Cappadocia and neighboring provinces, and in the south, in the coastal provinces of the Mediterranean shores of Asia Minor across from Cyprus. There were other Christian communities which had survived into the 20th century. Most of these communities had adopted the Turkish language with the passage of time and the disappearance of Greek education, but maintained their identity within the fold of the Orthodox Church. The linguistic identity of those communities, which had preserved the Greek language in their local idioms, is a striking linguistic phenomenon which attracted the interest of the Oxford Hellenist Richard Dawkins. It was a, linguist, a phenomenon of linguistic survival completely unknown until it was noticed by a French traveler in the second half of the 19th century. And that information was picked up by Dawkins, who, with a caravan of mules, was touring Asia Minor in the, in, touring those difficult regions, the highlands of Pontus and Cappadocia, on the eve of the First World War to record the Greek idioms which had survived in those isolated regions. Greek linguistic idioms had survived until the exodus of 1923-1925. In 32 of the 81 Orthodox communities of Cappadocia, in a small community, Sili, just outside Iconium, and in these two coastal communities, Macri and Livisi, in Lycia, close to the city of St. Nicholas. The furthest southeast extremity of the network of Greek language in Asia Minor was located at Pharasa, see there, in the anti-Taurus mountain. A community unknown and forgotten until it was visited by Dawkins in the eve of the First World War. And I remember one of the collaborators of the Center for Asia Minor Studies, who was a priest in a refugee community in the outskirts of Athens, who used to tell me that he, as a boy, he remembered Dawkins arriving with his mules at Farasa. And he said, I remember him coming to the village and I kissed his hand. So I had this first hand uh, testimony of how this idiom survived. And of course, with the better technological facilities at our disposal in the 21st century, we could at least record and tape uh, Father Thodoros from uh, Farasa speaking the Farasiot idiom, which is a highly idiomatic form of Greek. So it was the ethnography and music of the communities of Cappadocia as I said, completely unknown to Greek scholarship, to Greek thought and sensibility until these people were uprooted and transferred to Greece in the 1920s. That captured the imagination of a great visionary, Melpolog Otheti Merlier, who was a musicologist, trained in Western music in the great centers of musical education in Western Europe, who decided in the 1930s to devote her life to the recording of the music 
the folklore and the community history of those communities, which all of a sudden became part of the Greek world after their uprooting and transfer to Greece. This was the Greek world, which had survived in Asia Minor and had managed through many historical vicissitudes to reach the centuries of modernity. The new era, associated with the imposition of Ottoman rule on the whole of the peninsula from the 15th century, had some notable changes in the Greek presence in Asia Minor. First, this presence, with the exception of the Pontic communities in their highlands, had shrunk. But from the 18th century onwards, fresh reverse movements began to bring back the Greeks, Greek-speaking individuals and groups, to the western regions of the peninsula. Successive, successive waves of movements from continental Greece, and above all from the islands of the Aegean, returned the Greek element to Asia Minor and gave rise to the consolidated settlements in the western regions of the peninsula, which, with the communities of the interior, which we just discussed, form what the co-founder of the Center for Asia Minor Studies, Octave Merlier, called the Dernier Hellenism, the last Hellenism of Asia Minor. And I want now to talk about this last Hellenism as it was researched by the Center for Asia Minor Studies. The last Hellenism became the protagonist in a new flourishing period in the long history of the Greek presence in the eastern sides of the Aegean. Now, we come to this map, which I kept as it has been produced in the 1970s, which is a summary of the work that the Center for Asia Minor Study has done in recording the communities which formed this last Hellenism. The main urban foci of this glorious period whose peak coincided with the hopes and promises brought about by the Ottoman reforms in the 19th century, where Smyrna, as an important Mediterranean port, commercial hub, and meeting point of nationalities and cultures, Smyrna made its presence felt in modern history as early as the 17th century, as among numerous other sources, the then British consul in the city, Paul Rico, bears witness, who was also one of the earliest sources to speak about the Orthodox Church to a Western public in the 17th century. The inflow of Greek population to the Ionian metropolis took place mainly in the 18th century, including waves of refugees from the Peloponnese after the failure of the Orlov revolt in 1770, and greatly swelled in the 19th century, in fact, after the achievement of Greek independence. The new Greek populations which flowed into Smyrna also included newcomers from the interior of Asia Minor, particularly Cappadocia. These movements produced the Greek Smyrna of the years of great prosperity, cosmopolitanism, and an upsurge of national feeling in the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Similarly, Trebizond, the best city in the East, and the eye of the whole of Asia, as it is described by one of its medieval encomias, developed from the 17th century as a station on the Silk Road and as the, an ecclesiastical, intellectual, and economic center of the Pontic world and its Asian hinterland. It was with these two major cities as its focal points in Constantinople as a constant point of reference that Asia Minor Hellenist Bergen during the 19th and the early 20th century 
their fluorescence is perceptible in the demographic development recorded in the notable increase in the population, particularly in the provinces of Western Asia Minor, but also in Pontus, in economic activity, particularly the development of commerce and in education. A precondition, of course, as I have already mentioned, for all this was the new freedom and toleration secured for the non-Muslim minorities during the period of reforms in the Ottoman Empire from 1839 and especially from 1856 onwards, especially during the period of the reign of Sultan Abdul Majid. For its Greek Christian subjects, however, the new possibilities and prospects strengthened considerably by significant economic achievements also favored by the reforms had a strong foundation in the long-standing traditions of the Orthodox community, the Genos. And I must tell you, when I saw the Orthodox community this morning at Hagia Sophia in Los Angeles, I was thinking exactly of these traditions of the Genos in the Ottoman period and in the diaspora. The traditions of the Genos during the long centuries of subjection were the Orthodox Christian faith and Greek letters. These factors determined the identity of the community, the cohesion of which was safeguarded by collective life within the church. Education, by means of which the tradition of Greek letters was reproduced and transmitted, was the object of the constant consent of the church it was on this foundation that in most favor, favorable times, the Enlightenment brought the messages of modernity into the Orthodox community's life. In the major cities of Asia Minor, important educational institutions operated, which transmitted the traditions of Orthodoxy and Greek letters to the younger generation. The renowned Frontisterion, a high school, founded in Trebizond by Sevastos Kiminitis in 1682, and the Evangelical School, which was founded in 1733 by the Notables of Smyrna, and placed under British protection, as a matter of fact, to secure its unimpeded op operation. These two foundations were the principal pillars of Greek education in Asia Minor, and provided the training grounds of the leadership, not only of Asia Minor Hellenism, but together with certain other seats of learning elsewhere in the Greek world on the European side, provided the training of leadership of the enslaved Genos. The further advances of education in Asia Minor were grounded on this infrastructure. The most important of these developments was the reception of the Enlightenment in the schools of Smyrna, with the foundation of the Philological Gymnasium in 1809, and the Academy of Kidonias, Ivalik, right there. An almost entirely Greek city founded <coughs> in the 18th century, which developed on the shores of Aeolis, primarily thanks to the commerce in olive oil in its products. <coughs> An almost <coughs> entirely Greek city, excuse me, which from the second half of the 18th century developed into a, tru a truly flourishing cradle and testimony of the potential of Hellenism in Asia Minor. Apart from education, Greek pedia in the broader sense of intellectual culture, produced many further manifestations in Asia Minor. Always centering or emanating from Smyrna in the course of the 19th century, this took place chiefly in publishing activity with the appearance between 1832 and 1922 <coughs> of 2,375 publications, books, periodicals, newspapers, 
booklets, pamphlets, and so forth from the Greek printed presses of Smyrna. Also in the world of the press, with the publication of such an important newspaper as Amalthea, 1838-1922 of continuous publishing, and many other newspapers of various and, new, and literary, religious, and commercial periodicals. All these features could be termed a belated enlightenment, which was not confined, of course, to Smyrna, to Kidonias, or to Trebizond, but extended to many other cities and even smaller towns throughout the peninsula. Within the framework of the multifaceted development and prosperity, both material and cultural, the national ideal as a vision of freedom was rekindled among the Greeks of Asia Minor. For the Kingdom of Greece, the national idea was the, what was called the great idea, which meant the expansion of Greek state to become coterminous with the communities of Hellenism spread in Asia Minor and in the Balkans. But for those communities themselves, the national idea was the expectation and the hope of freedom, what the Greeks of Priini said in the fourth century, that nothing is more important for the Greeks than liberty. And this vision was shaped from the period of the Enlightenment onwards. It was given dynamic expression by the part played by the Greeks of Asia Minor in the Greek Revolution of the 1820s and the sacrifices they suffered with the destruction of the city of Kidonias, with large-scale massacres in Smyrna and elsewhere, and of course in Constantinople. And it reached its culmination in the final decades of the 19th century and the first 20 years of the 20th. The manifestation of national feeling on the part of the Greeks of Asia Minor vividly colored the intellectual life of the period. And we read this in literary sources and also we see it recorded in the arts. For a moment, in the circumstances of then of the First World War, It appeared that the fullness of time had finally arrived with the Greek landing at, at Smyrna in 1919 and the Treaty of Sevres in 1920, both of these important developments, the achievements of the greatest leader of modern Greece, Eleftherios Venizelos. The visions and expectations of modernity and the long historic heritage of Hellenism on the eastern shores of the Aegean seemed at last for that short period to have found their vindication and fulfillment. What followed in a literal enactment in history of Aristotle's concept of peripetia, reversal, from the poetics, that is a change by which the action veers around to its opposite. E isto enandion ton pratomenon metaboli. Was the catastrophe an unspeakable pathos of a manifold and truly devastating humanitarian catastrophe, which involved massacres on large scale and then the tragic process of uprooting. Ultimately, the cunning of history seemed to have cancelled out the illustrious course charted by three millennia of Hellenic presence in the east of the Aegean. However, the future of Asia Minor Hellenism, all those miserable and uprooted refugees who arrived to the islands and to the mainland in the fall months of 1922 and throughout 1923 and even 24, the Pharisees whom we saw earlier, learned about it out there, as far as I, that they had to leave in 1925 when they said the bell rang and we went to church 
and they told us, now you have to leave. Go where? Go to your homeland, Vatan in Turkish. Where was this homeland? Where they had to go. So that is the pathos and the pity of the refugee exchange. But despite all of this, with the evidence clearer before our eyes 100 years later, and with the cultural and historical heritage of this part of Hellenism much better and authoritatively known today, we can say that there are in the nature of things possibilities which permit, after all, the cunning of history to be overcome and its sardonic smile to be wiped away in the face of the indomitable resilience of human will and creativity, precisely as this human will and creativity was exemplified by the uprooted who Hellenized Greek Macedonia and who brought their skills and their human resources to Greek society from the 1920s onwards. That, of course, is another story. The story of the relocation and integration of the refugee population of Greece, which is not either a happy or an easy story. It had its pain also. But in the long run, over the 100 years, the outcome was positive. And the integration of this population into Greek society, as it has been mentioned uh, before by the General Council, had multiple benefits and brought great blessings to Greek society. This turned out eventually to be the veritable catharsis of the tragedy of 1922, a catharsis that nobody, of course, could suspect in 1922 when all of this happened. Thank you for the, your patience.